Uh, you'll see this uh, at the beginning of lecture. You'll get so used to it, you'll forget about the stuff that's on there. Uh, I'll be putting the SI schedule on there eventually. As, okay. And I'll try to be careful. Um, anyways, let's take a, just to reinforce... I didn't even do anything. This... This is burning my grits. All right. Anyway, let's uh, take a look at the exam schedule. Just to reinforce, um, midterm exam is Tuesday, February 7th. Um, it's less than a month from now. Midterm exam two is on March 7th. So two sevens, and then April 11th for midterm three. Now the procedure for these is uh, we will uh, the procedure is we will uh, drop the lowest of the three. If you take three, if you miss one, that's going to be a zero, and that's the grade that we drop automatically, and you'll just have the other two. But uh, try to make all three, and you'll be in good shape. Uh, final examination for you guys is Tuesday, May 2nd. Is that right? Section 1? Okay. Uh, and just for your uh, convenience, if you have a Mac or an iPhone or something or iPad, uh, you can use the WebCal link that's on our uh, web courses uh, page, web courses site, uh, and put that into your calendar app. Uh, anybody do that yet? Okay. Um, it, so when you, when you did that, did you cut and paste it and just, you know, yeah. Did it work pretty good? Yeah. yeah. Uh, anybody try it with an Android device? I don't know if it's, there's probably apps that will handle WebCal, but uh, it's not a built-in feature of... So here's another look at the exam schedule, even more abbreviated, February 7th for midterm exam 1, March 7th for midterm exam 2, April 11th for midterm exam 3, and they'll be right here in the lecture hall. We'll spread out and, you know, have plenty of elbow room, and it'll be a one-hour test. And uh, But then the final is a th basically a three hours, two hours and 50 minutes. And it's twice as big as a midterm. And for us, it's on May 2nd. And, it, and we meet at 10 a.m. All right, questions about that exam schedule? First five rows, please. First five rows. First five rows, yeah. Any questions about exams and stuff? Okay, let's keep going. Uh, office hours. I had office hours yesterday, 9 to 11, and not a single one of you guys came. But that's normal for the first week of classes. Uh, I expect to see uh, bunches of you, especially as the exams approach, and so that'll be good. Uh, Caroline is going to have office hours on Friday this semester, so... If your Wednesday mornings are like totally wall-to-wall -wall busy, uh, you might be able to uh, uh, connect with uh, Caroline during her office hours. Uh, and Miss Darian sitting to my left, I uh, haven't figured out, has not figured out if she's going to have office hours or not. So we're still waiting for her to figure out what she's going to do. And, uh, but for sure, Caroline and for sure me, and uh, I highly re recommend to you to get over there to the Physical Sciences Building, PSB, and attend one of the office hours if you can. If you can't, you can't. But if you can, it's very productive. You know, it's, it's just so you know, um, raise your hand if you're an ed major of some kind. 
secondary ed, elementary ed, uh, your early childhood ed. Okay, there's a few of you. One of the things that uh, you'll learn about if you haven't already is uh, one of the educational findings that from educational research over the years, they found that lectures like this are the least efficient method for teach for students learning new information. And that every minute outside the conventional lecture hall is much like office hours is much more efficient for learning. And it, and they've they've studied it over and over and they found that this is the case that lectures conventional lectures are least efficient and guess what we do the most of here at ECF conventional lectures so that's why I always say that every minute that you can spend uh, with me and office hours Caroline and SI similar um, it's going to help you learn and that is what our objective is so if you haven't been to the physical sciences building this is an older picture. Um, the counseling center is over here um, and right next to the shuttle stop. Okay, so the shuttle buses stop there. And then on this side, if you look over on the right-hand side of this picture, that's Harris Engineering. And then this parking lot where all these cars are, uh, that's right next to Sumter. So uh, you know, it kind of gives you an idea where to go. If you're looking to track me down on a Wednesday. Now, Tuesday and Thursday, I'm not over there. And by the way, you may have noticed that I didn't put my telephone number on the syllabus. Now, that's not because my telephone number is top secret or anything. But I'm hardly ever over there. And I go weeks, months sometimes, between check and voicemail. First five rows, please. And uh, so it... It's just not a good way to communicate with me. But web courses messaging, yeah, I'm, I'm on that all the time. Okay, supplemental instruction schedule. Uh, we'll be giving you that information uh, as soon as possible. Have you heard any rumors? Nothing. Okay, so Maria, she's going to be in this section every Tuesday and Thursday, taking notes. And so you can come, and, and I encourage you, to come up and sit in the front row next to Maria and, uh, you know, pick her brain and, and ask her questions while I'm lecturing and stuff. She's, she'll be happy to help you out. Uh, but she'll, she'll be getting that hopefully next week, hopefully next Tuesday, our next meeting, we'll know what the schedule is. It usually takes the second week before we know. Okay, I want to reemphasize re a few things about the textbook. Um, interactions. I wrote it. Um, there's the cover photo uh, that I talk about extensively in the introduction, which hopefully those of you ha that have gotten the book have already started to read. Um, how do you get it? Well, you can purchase it at the UCF bookstore, as I mentioned, or go to that URL that's listed on the syllabus, kendallhunt.com slash Brickner. Uh, and that's probably the better place to buy it if you can. If you have to buy it at the bookstore, you got to buy it at the bookstore. Uh, but Kindle Hunt's going to save you a little bit of money, and it's faster. And then you download the Bookshelf app uh, from Vitalsource.com. Ooh, I misspelled that. Vitalsource, S-O-U-R-C-E. Um, and... Uh, I, do you ever, do you use that on your cell phone, the bookshelf? Do you are you using it on your cell phone? How does it is it runs good? Yeah. Okay. I use it on my laptop. I don't put it on my cell phone, but uh, I try to keep stuff simple on my cell phone. Anyways, get that, and then you can start reading and studying um, and using highlights. Let me show you a couple glances at it. Here's what the website looks like, uh, and uh, you. $85, and you can use your debit card or something. You all know how to do that. Then when you download the application bookshelf, this is what it looks like. If you have um, Kendall Hunt textbooks from other classes, you'll see them here. This is my bookshelf. I have two books, the first edition here, the second edition over here, highlighted. And when you click on that, 
it opens up another window. So you have two windows, the library window and then the textbook window itself. And so here's one of the pages in the introduction. Um, and you can see the text and a photo of Galileo. And one thing I want to point out to you that is helpful uh, in this bookshelf application, and that is highlights. Uh, so make a note of that in your notes for today. I need to get highlights activated in bookshelf because you can subscribe to my highlights. It's all of our applications can be linked. All right. And so you can look at my highlights that I type in as I read the book. And I wrote the book and I still put in highlights, you know, little comments, you know, that I think about after lecture or that I think of before lecture. And uh, that will help you. Uh, here's, you know, here's one of the highlights right there. And uh, this is from the introduction. Um, if you read my highlights, well, let's just put it this way. You want to try to get to understand the things that I think are important. Now, if I don't think it's important, I'm not going to put a highlight about it. I'll just go, I'll just, you know, something occurs to me, but it's not that important. I won't highlight it. So everything in the highlights, and the same thing in lecture, everything that I talk about in lecture is something that I consider important. I can lecture, I could lecture for three straight years every day for the entire year, and then for three years about Sir Isaac Newton and his laws of motion, all right? But I don't. We, we have to pick and choose on the things that are most important, and that's what I talk about in lecture. Okay, and then on exams, I'm trying to interrogate that gray matter between your ears to see if you savvy what I think is important, the important stuff in physics. Okay, uh, so lecture notes are like that, and so are the highlights. Now, let me show you how to subscribe. Um, I use, you use an email address of another user. So you can subscribe to your study partners, you know, and you can, you know, communicate that way. Um, the email address that I use is a phony email address in Knight's Mail. Uh, here it is, uh, brewbeckner at knights.ucf.edu. And yeah, that is deliberately misspelled. Uh, I use, you know what I use it for? I use it as a dummy address for like if I'm joining a website or subscribing to something and I don't want to pay any attention to the emails. I just give them that. But you guys can use it. I used it to register my bookshelf app. And so you can subscribe to my highlights. And I, I believe it's in the library window. Make a note of that. The library window where subscribing for highlights is there. I think there's a little figure of a human um, and you click on that and it asks you who your friends are or something like that. And you type in my email address, and this email address, and, uh, and go to town. All right. So don't use that to send me any email messages. That's another thing that I don't ever check. Uh, but I use it um, for, for highlights. So you guys can subscribe to my highlights and learn to think even more efficiently uh, as a scientist. Questions about the textbook? Okay, let's keep going. I want to do a practice question with you on iClicker. Uh, and let me get my iClicker out. And I'll quit with you. Okay, so take out your iClicker. If you have it, if you don't have it, it's all right. Um, and what I want you to do since this is the first time you're using it, we're going to use frequency BB, bravo, bravo. Okay, so the way that you do this is, hold on, let me get this rubber band off. Okay, you turn on the power button and you hold it down. 
And in the upper left, the, the letters start to flash, and you type in BB. And then you'll get a check mark, and then it'll say Go Nitro. Okay? Did you get Go Nitro? Raise your hand if you got Go Nitro. Sweet. Okay. You guys are clicking. Now, if you're not registered, I won't know that your clicks are, are I won't know you from Adam, clicking-wise, until you're registered. Now, I did notice Elizabeth Hurt. Are you here? Elizabeth Hurt, she must be in this. I had a couple students email or message me in web courses about, did I get registered? And they did. And uh, I'll be given one bonus point if you're registered uh, by about 1 o'clock. No, by about 2 o'clock today when I upload data. Uh, so if you haven't registered yet. Um, now, if, if you get the Go Nitro, then it says ready. Okay? And it'll remember frequency BB. Now, if your other class uses iClicker, the other instructor might use um, AC or DA or some other frequency. So you got to be ready for that. But in here, we're going to use BB. Okay? All right. Now, I have a very difficult scientific question. I want you to think about it using your uh, brain. Uh, this is not right. This is completely... All right. All right, we're backing up, I guess. Okay, practice question, I clicker two, frequency BB. All right, here's your, okay, if it says ready, that means you're ready to click. Now I want you to, now that I've got your attention, I want you to think very carefully about the following question. So just, uh, anyways, this is just a practice question, so we're just screwing around. But anyways, type in A, B, C, D, or E, whichever one you think is the correct answer. And, uh, and actually, I'll give you 30 seconds to finish. To finish thinking about it. And I want to see who's voting. For <laughs> oh, there's... What's can you can I see this the timer? This you you know I think there's some wise acres in here. Uh, I can't show you the results. Okay, ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a day. All right. My, my wife has the same ringer. Uh, you know, we, we, we have to be serious. There were people in here, five people in here that voted for D, and three people voted for E. Now, what? The? It was you? Gosh. Anyway, uh, 41 people in here. Let's see how many people voted. 46, 54, 59, 62 people. Good. 62 people voted. Uh, the, but, you know, most of you got it wrong. This is the correct answer. Bruce. And a little known fact, little known Chuck Norris fact, the only guy that ever beat up Chuck Norris, it was in this movie, The Way of the Dragon, back in 1972. Anyway, uh, Keep your clickers ready. We're going to have a regular uh, physics question in just a few minutes. Okay? And, but just so you know, we're going to continue doing a few practice questions every day. And we might have a Chuck Norris question or so. But we're going to tend to making, to, to making more of uh, physics-type questions. So now I want to get back to, um, now that we've uh, tried the, the clicker, 
I want to get back to talking about this thing that we do, this learning thing. Or as I mentioned last time, that the quest for, for what we seek, what we seek, that which is true. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more. Uh, one of the things um, that you can ask about the truth is, does it reside in the thing or does it reside only in the intellect? Now, one of the earliest philosophers was Aristotle. And look at his answer. His answer, you know, his definition of truth. Boy, it's pretty word. It's verbose. It's wordy. To say of what is that it is not, or of what is not that it is, is false. So he's defining falsity first, then a truth in C and D. While to say of what it is that it is, and of what is not that it is not, is true. Now that's from his metaphysics. And that's pretty much a normal definition of truth. Augustine... Uh, St. Augustine defined it, uh, that is true which is. That is true which is. Very simple. Uh, and Thomas Aquinas, this is the, the definition that I like, and they're all consistent. Uh, they're all um, you know, consistent. Uh, that truth is that towards which the intellect tends, toward which the intellect tends is moving and that is kind of what I've been trying to point out to you that it is our nature to learn and to seek that which is true and the question I posed to you last time how do you recognize it let's talk about that now what are the criteria of the truth now in the scientific enterprise that's what we're going to be talking about for the main part of the semester but you may as well also uh, Ask, what are the criterion of truth in other areas, other activities of life? For instance, a love letter or a sonnet. And if you don't think I'm right, just look at this famous phrase. And there they twine. Did I get this right, Darian? In a true love's knot, the red, red rose and the briar, right? That's from the song Barbara Allen, True Love. That's what we, you know, that's what you seek. Here's another area, court of law. We talked about this a little bit. The whole idea of taking an oath. And in federal, now here's some notes for you. You can, you know, you, don't, you can't take notes on me singing a, a song, but uh, yeah, federal courts, federal rule of evidence number 804. Exceptions to hearsay. Now you've heard, if, if you've listened to Law and Order or CSI or something, you know, well, that's hearsay evidence. You can't admit that in a court of law. And in general, yeah, hearsay is inadmissible in general. But there are exceptions, and that's what Federal Rule of Evidence number 804 is about. What are the exceptions to the hearsay rule? And here's one of them. Statement under belief of imminent death. That's admissible. In other words, a deathbed confession. That's what, we, that's what we're talking about. In a court of law, the sign of the truth, or one of the signs of the truth, can be that someone has made a deathbed confession. Because why would somebody not speak the truth on their deathbed? All right, that's the presumption. All right, now it's not everything, but if you have a statement of that kind, a deathbed confession, it has the presumption of truth and it is admissible. Another one, a little bit fancier, statement against interest is admissible. Now you might say to yourself, Dr. B, what is a statement of what is a statement of against interest in Rule 804, Federal Rules of Evidence? Well, it's a statement that you would never make unless it was true. It's, it, it's a statement that is so contrary to your interests, whether they're proprietary, in other words, your pr property, pecuniary, in other words, your money, uh, or 
if, it, if it's a statement that has a tendency to expose you to criminal or civil liability. You would never, so it's like saying um, a statement against interest is, is like admitting that you committed a crime, all right? So that's a state, you would normally not say that because it's against your interest. And your defense lawyer would never permit you to say that. But if you did make a statement like that, it has the presumption of being true. All right, so that's in a court of law. Now, so make a note, federal rule of evidence, exceptions to hearsay, and there's other exceptions. And, you know, if you want to go to law school, you can learn all about evidence and truth and how to establish it in a court of law. There's other factors as well, but this is uh, a little glance at federal rule 804. Now, let's get back to the scientific enterprise. We've talked about um, a love song. We've talked about a court of law. Let's talk about the scientific enterprise. And here's an here's a artist's depiction of Galileo uh, looking through a telescope. He's, he did not invent the telescope, but he did invent its use as an observation tool to observe the universe, the moon, the planets, the stars, and the sun as well. He discovered sunspots using a telescope. The whole thing, the starting point for the scientific enterprise is basically this. Can you predict the future state of X, whether it's a cannonball or a ping pong ball or a ship in the ocean or a sound wave propagating across a lake? What is the future state? What's going to happen? How do you, in the introduction to my book, I talk about a football game. You look, everybody's looking at the action on the field because they want to know who's going to win. You know, every play tends to advance the team to victory or back it away from victory. All right, so prediction of a future state. And in a scientific enterprise, it has a very precise uh, nature. First of all, um, he, the scientist uh, makes observations about the universe. Okay? In other words, he's not thinking about stuff that he dreams about at night. It's about stuff that you can observe. Nobody can say that a dream is an observation. Because nobody else can see it. All right? Um, and he asks questions like this. Is there a plan? Or is there a pattern in what I've just observed and what the scientist sees? Is there a clear interaction of physical objects that he's observing? You know, it's always about what the observer sees. That's the key question. That's Einstein's famous question. What does the observer see? And... To get down to specifics, down to the nitty-gritty, okay, what does the observer see? Does he see a clear interaction of physical objects? Um, another thing, see, here's a baseball. So, you know, is there some interaction between the baseball and anything else? Where's, you know, if you hit the baseball, are you going to have a home run? Or are you going to pop up and get an out, sacrifice fly? Or is it going to dribble back to the pitcher and then he throws you out at first base by a mile? And then you got to hang your head down all the way back to the dugout. All right? So you want to be able to do that um, and basically predict the future state uh, of what you see. And the reason for that, you know, so you're advancing from time t equals zero to some future time. Um, you want to know what the interactions are. You want to see if there's some pattern in the interactions or if there's some pattern in the, in the distances or the positions or the times or the speeds, the velocities. You know, is there a pattern? And what we have found, starting with Galileo, is that, yes, there are patterns. And we can describe them very, very carefully. And what, once we figured out a way to describe them, we want to be able to communicate it to at least one other person. All right? It's not something that you, you figure out and then you write it down on a piece of paper and then you go have a cup of coffee or you move to uh, California 
and you forget about it. The whole idea is to communicate it to somebody else under the assumption that they are anxious to learn, that they want to learn about this stuff. And you may say to yourself, Dr. B, that's very nice. You know, I don't really... I don't really care about baseballs that much. I don't really care. But, you know, I defy you. Anybody that in here, anybody in here that says that, I defy you to go through life saying, I don't really, I don't need to learn anything about that. Every day about every topic, you will not be able to get out of bed in the morning. You've got to... That is the way our brains are oriented. That is the thi- one of the things that we do. All right? And a scientist answers it in this particular way. Now, here's a very fancy looking formula that uh, Galileo figured out. Y subscript F equals Y subscript I plus V subscript IY times T plus one half gt squared. Now we're going to hack that equation apart. We're going to take it apart, put it together, and you're going to be very familiar with this equation. You won't be now. This is just a nice little photograph, a sneak preview of coming attractions. But yeah, that's what uh, one of the things that Galileo was able to produce. So Galileo is the one that began uh, what we call the modern scientific enterprise. And he established what is considered um, an acceptable and reliable answer. And that's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, It was about 400 years ago. And in his day, he was very controversial. And I don't care how controversial you may, you know, like uh, Donald Trump or Donald Trump's wife or... uh, President Putin from Russia or any other place in this world, any controversial person, Galileo was a really controversial guy all over Europe. Now, here's one of the things that he said. In a book that he wrote in 1623, it was a book about comets. They were having this disputation about comets. You know, what are they? How do they move? Why are they visible at certain times and not other times? And in this book, the, uh, the surveyor, or the, I should say the assayer, Il Saggiatore, in 1623, he said this, Philosophy is written in this grand book, I mean the universe, which stands continually open to our gaze, but it cannot be understood unless one first learns to comprehend the language and interpret the characters in which this book is written. Now, this is what I was telling you about. The the scientist observes the universe, or as Galileo put it, he reads this book. And what are the characters in which it is written? Here's his answer to that. And these quotes are all in your textbook, so don't feel like you have to write them down. It is written... Said Gal- or wrote Galileo, the grand book of the universe. It is written in the language of mathematics. Its characters are triangles, circles, and other geometrical figures, without which it is humanly impossible to understand a single word of it, and without these, one is wandering about in a dark labyrinth. Now, get, when Galileo wrote that, That was his statement of the criterion of truth, one of the criterion, criteria of truth in the scientific enterprise, that thing that we do. Its character is mathematical. The statements that he wants to produce have a mathematical structure. There are sentences that you write with regular old A, B, C, D letters. And then parallel or accompanying those sentences are mathematical figures, uh, equations, and symbols. And that was his conviction. Now, before 
Uh, Aristotle didn't think of it that way. You know, Aristotle, he, he knew some math. You know, the Greeks were pretty good mathematicians. And in Aristotle's day, there were plenty of mathematicians, you know, that were way better than Aristotle. I mean, he was, he was not known for mathematics, but plenty of other guys were. But they didn't think of the universe in that way. Galileo did. He's the one that said, if, if you're observing the universe, you've got to be able to say a true statement, and the true statement has got to have some kind of a mathematical structure behind it. That's the backbone of it. All right. Now, that's different from a court of law. There's nothing mathematical about a court of law, or a love letter, or a piece of music, or any other... Th you know, well, I probably shouldn't say that about music. Yeah. Music theory... D Darian's a music expert. Well, she's an expert compared to me. I'm kind of, a, I'm not very. But anyways, music is mathematical. But for, for Galileo, yeah, it's mathematical. It has to be. It has to be something you observe. It has to have a mathematical character. And it's something that you have to be able to communicate to another human being. And they have to comprehend it, you know, and, and be able to re-verify all your observations, all right? And motion, getting from point A to point B, is where Galileo starts. That, that famous quote, the universe is a grand book that we read, continually open to our gaze. He was talking about comets. What were they? And how do they get from point A to point B on their orbit? I mean, they didn't even know. You know what? Galileo was completely wrong about comets. He has a big reputation, but he biffed it on comets. He thought they were in the atmosphere. They were part of the atmosphere of Earth. But they're, you know, and other people thought, no, they're out in space. You know, they thought they're out there, you know, where the planets are and stuff like that. It, and that is actually where they are. Um, but it was a conversation about motion that got that whole thing started. So let's think about the very uh, most basic element of motion, and that's velocity. Velocity is a speed and a direction. You have to know where you're going and how fast you're going there. And these encode the motion of an object so well that you can predict its future state. If you know the direction you're going and if you know how fast you're going there, all you got to know is how long you're traveling and you'll know exactly where you're going to end up at some future time, one minute from now or one hour from now or however long you travel at that velocity, all right? So you predict a position at a future time and maybe even a velocity at a future time. And everybody knows, uh, raise your hand if you've ever driven from Orlando to Miami on the turnpike or, or nine, okay, that's a bunch of you. And you know that when you're driving down there, you, I know all of you are very law-abiding young men and women. You never break the speed law. <laughs> uh, but you know that there are people that do, and they go above the speed limit sometime. No, that's not you. But there are people that break that law. They go faster, but then they got to, as soon as they see a cop, then they slow down. So people's velocity changes the speed. You know, you're still going to Miami. You're heading south, heading to see a Miami Heat game. You got to get there, but your speed's not going to be the same. Or if you pull off and, you know, get snacks at a, at the at the, uh, you know, at the gas. What do they call this place? The 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 uh, the the Turkey Neck Plaza. Isn't that what they call it? No, Turkey Lake, Turkey Lake uh, Service Plaza or whatever it's called. Anyways, those places where you stop and get gas and everything and food. Uh, you got to stop. So your velocity is not going to be the same. So what you need um, to be able to predict all this stuff at a future time, of all the things that you, you, know, you can predict, motion is the most basic. Um, if you know how the velocity evolves over time, either faster, slower, or maybe changing different directions, you know, so like... Uh, you get a call from your roommate and you got to head back to Orlando. Okay, you change over to the other side of the interstate and you head back home. 
change of direction. If you know all of those, how the velocity evolves over time, or as we say, the equation of motion, or equations, plural, or the time evolution equations for the car that you're in, or, or the spacecraft that you're studying, the comet, if you know those equations of motion, or, or the time evolution equations, those are kind of synonymous, then you can figure out where it's going to be whenever you want to figure it out, pretty much. Oh, you know, there's a, has ev anybody seen that movie? Uh, it just came out a couple weeks ago, or a couple days ago. Hidden Numbers? About hidden figures? Has anybody seen that? I want to go see that. That's all about one. One person. Okay, I'll have a little chat with you after I go see it. Okay, that's good. I'm going to go see that. Um, yeah, that's what those that's what those guys... They employ half the PhDs in the planet down there at Mission Control in Houston to figure out these enormous sets of equations of motion. And back in, in, in the days of that movie, they still did a lot of it by hand. And manual backup. Matter of fact, that's one of the things, the reason they did that uh, at Mission Control is because they also taught the, uh, the astronauts to do it. Matter of fact, raise your hand if you've ever seen that, uh, that movie, uh, Apollo 13 with Tom Hanks. Okay, that's a fair number. It's a movie about the Apollo 13 mission and how it had an explosion on the way to the moon and they had to figure out a way to get back. And they, those guys in the capsule, had to do calculations because their computers were down. They had to be able to do it. So that's what this movie, Hidden Figures, is about. And it's all about equations of motion. So what you're going to be learning about is what those women knew in that movie. Good. So motions in two dimensions plus time. Let's think about this. And we, th we start talking about this in chapter one of the textbook. All right, you're studying the motion of an object that moves between point A and point B. All right, that's very nice. Um, and uh, you got to know where you start. And what, you know, the thing that you have to do is figure out some kind of a coordinate system. So what I've done here, you, you may have noticed, let's see. Notice this slide. There's no graph paper. This slide there is. You see it? And let's put a coordinate axis set in there. Go ahead and put a y-axis and an x-axis horizontally. And we'll put the origin down here in the lower left where that square red, rec this red square is. Okay? We can put it anywhere we want, but well, just for, for convenience, we'll put it down there. And once we've done that, then we can figure out the x and y coordinates in two dimensions of both points. All right. And now the thing about it is, um, are you working in uh, meters or miles or maybe nanometers? Nanometers, that's more uh, appropriate for atoms. Uh, human beings, meters or centimeters is not bad. Miles, now you're talking about civic dimensions, cities and towns and counties. Um, so let's, let's think in terms of meters. All right, so this is you going, this is a human being going from point A to point B. And therefore we're going to measure it in meters. And on this particular set of graph paper, this coordinate set, point A. A has coordinates uh, 8, 16. 8 meters to the right of the origin, 16 meters above the origin. Right? And similarly, point B up there has coordinates 44, 24. 44 meters to the right or to the east of the origin, and 24 meters above the origin or to the north of the origin, you might say. All right, so uh, go ahead and draw a dotted line. 
All right. Now we're moving from point A to point B, and this is a straight line path. And with that is a distance, this particular line segment. Go ahead and sketch in a triangle like this, and if you want, you can kind of ease it down here, down below, so you kind of keep it off to the side for comparison. But yeah, that's the hypotenuse. The distance from point A to point B, in this diagram anyways, is the hypotenuse of a right triangle, which I've reproduced in yellow. And the width of it is 36 meters. The height of it is 8 meters. Why is that? Well, 44 minus 8 is 36. The two x coordinates are 44 and 8. So 44 minus 8 is 36. Right? And the two y coordinates are 16 and 24. So 24 minus 16 is 8 meters. Right? And um, I invite you to make a note that in the appendix of our textbook, if you want to bone up on uh, right triangles and stuff, Pythagorean theorem, there's a little bit more extra reading back there uh, in the appendix. Now we're going to work on it here. We have a clicker question coming up, so don't put your clickers away yet. Um, anyway, so read more about that in the appendix. All right, how would you do the uh, Pythagorean theorem for this one? Well, the hypotenuse is, okay, so the traditional symbol is C. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So in this case, C squared equals 36 squared plus 8 squared. All right, go ahead and write that down. I don't have it on the screen for you, but you can write it down. Hypotenuse squared equals 36 squared plus 8 squared. That's the Pythagorean theorem. So the distance D is the square root of that. So make sure your square root goes over the top of all of that expression, 36 squared plus 8 squared, all the way out. All right? And then you add them up inside. So 36, can you do that quick? 30, uh, get your calculator. You, you're going to need them in a second. Get your calculator out or your cell phone. 36 squared, that's like 10,000 or something? or 1296, 1,000. Anybody verify that? 36, 1296. Okay, so 1296 plus 8 squared, 64. So 1296 plus 64, 13. Yeah, okay, 1360. Good, I have it right. Okay, so there's your the stuff inside the square root. All right? And then to get the actual distance, D, you have to hit the square root button. All right, so you type in 1360, and then you figure out... And hey, you guys, if you have a calculator, you're going to have to figure out how to use a square root button and a couple other ones, scientific notation. Uh, well, we won't worry about scientific notation for a while yet, but uh, yeah, definitely we'll, we want to worry about uh, square root button. Yeah, so 36.9. Is that anybody verify me on that? 1360? Okay. All right. So there's a distance, you know, straight, straight line, path, distance, easy. Um, let's do this a similar calc. Well, let me let me pause for questions. Anybody have a question about this calculation? Yes. Yes, you may. Why do you ask me? Is that a graphing calculator? Yes. Okay. The question was, can you use a graphing calculator on an exam? And the answer is Y-E-S. Yes. It's not going to help you that much, but, but I mean, it's got everything you need. So, Another question. Okay. Um, My comment to you is start bringing your calculator every day because we'll probably do some calculations pretty much every day in class. And let's try one right now. Uh, so get your calculator. Turn it back on if it's off. 
and it'll say it'll say welcome and then ready and then we'll be ready to do this and sorry it doesn't say go nitro it says welcome anyways calculate the distance between point Q and point C and this is a multiple choice question eventually we'll be doing questions ba calculation based questions in which you type in the numbers and I'll show you how to do that probably next week we'll do a couple easy ones and hopefully this is an easy one for you and we'll go over the calculation after I give you the answer just so you can back up your answer Okay, 20 seconds. Ten seconds. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay, Darian closed it. Uh yeah, you guys did pretty good. Eighty-three percent of you got it right. Hundred and eleven. Now, let's go, for those of you that didn't, though, and I'll try to do this whenever we do calculations in class, let's go through the calculation. And even if you got it right, maybe you should jot this down. For this triangle, it's 62 squared plus 92 squared. And here are the two intermediate values, 3844, that's 62 squared, and 8464, that's 92 squared. Okay, and so you add those together, and what do you, what do you get? You get twelve three zero eight, and that's still inside the square root. All right. Now notice, uh, do you notice anything about the options? They're all whole numbers. Notice anything else? They might not be whole numbers. But there is something. What? What he's? Uh, it's Kristen, right? Yeah. Kristen. Yeah, I put I put thirty eight forty four and eighty four sixty four in there, and why do I do that? Cause on a multiple choice question, my objective is to see if you know the correct. I have to have the correct answer in there. And then I, I have to have some answers that are at least tempting. So if you really know your stuff, you'll just lock on to the correct answer and you won't be, I won't be able to shake you. But if you're a little shaky, you know, you might have the right answer. And then you see something, oh, wait a minute, 3844. Yeah, that's got to be it. You know, I, I'm going to do that. And every, everybody that writes a multiple choice test question, I don't care if it's the SAT or your psychology professor, or your sixth grade teacher, they have to have some questions that are, or some answers that are at least a little bit tempting. All right? So, by the way, this is the distance uh, from Cadoba in the Student Union over to Chick-fil-A, which I am ready for lunch right now, so this is actually, I wish I could... Go to either of those places right now. Anyway, there's the distance, 111 meters. And let's take a look at some of those other wrong answers, okay? Now, this is a critical question that you should, you know, you should write this down in your notes. When you're taking a multiple choice test with me or anybody else, if you don't know the answer right away, you can sometimes, you know, make an educated guess if you can eliminate at least one of the other options. All right, so let's see if we can uh, reject some answers here. All right. All right, now, 154. Why is that no good? 
154 is too big. That's the sum of the two perpendicular sides, 62 and 92. Now, if you're walking in New York City, you know, west on uh, 12th Street and then north on uh, 5th Avenue, the way I used to do, you know, when I was a student at NYU, um, yeah, that's, that's, how many, that's how many meters you got to go. But if, if you're going along the line, straight line CQ as a crow flies, no, you don't do that. You don't add those up. So that's too big. So you can reject that one. By the same token, 30, option B, is too small. All right? So you're taking a test, and you're thinking, boy, I wish I could eliminate at least one or two of these. And then you think to yourself, okay, it can't be B because it's too small. It can't be A because that's too big. All right? So X out those two. All right? And then you can say to yourself, whatever else happens, the hypotenuse has got to be somewhere between those two babies. It's somewhere between 30 and uh, between uh, uh, 62 and 154. Right? 62 is the shortest side. Right? So you can make some educated guesses. Now, we've already talked about these two guys here. Um, 84, 64, 38, 44. Those are the intermediate values, and they're way too big. They're, they're way bigger than 154. Okay? So they're, they're both out. And so if you can deduce that much... And 111 hasn't been X'd out, and it's the only thing left. Ching! That's your correct answer. All right? So I want you to remember that when you're doing multiple choice test questions with me. And just so you know, um, I hate trick questions. I am not going to ask you a question in which I give you five answers, 110, 111, 112, 113, 114, and ask you to figure out which one of those is right. I'm not going to do Or uh, 110.5, 110.7, 110.9, 111, and 111.3. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to give you questions where if you can do some thinking about the question and maybe reduce, e eject a couple of the options, then you can get your way, even if you don't have a calculator. You don't have to have a calculator to make these deductions, really. I mean, you just got to kind of know, uh, you just got to do some adding and subtracting in order to reject the, the first two, and then that helps you reject the second pair, and you're left with option E, which most of you got. 83% of you got that. Good. Now, let's get back to points A and B. Let me point out that this is the distance that a crow flies, but that might, that might be the distance a crow flies, but you might not be on uh, that particular path. What if you have a curved path? Like this. You know, you're going from point A to point B, and or you're a bird and you know you fly a little bit north and then a little bit south of this path, straight line path. Yeah, that's not out of the realm of possibility. Okay, so curved path, yeah, that's a possibility. What if you have a segmented path like this? Straight line, then another straight line, and then a straight line that finishes at the point B. Segmented path. Yeah, you could have one of those. Nothing, nothing wrong with that. All right? So not only do you have to have the endpoints, but really you have to have all the points of the motion. And with that, you have to have velocity information. To have velocity information, you also have to have temporal information. In other words, when does it reach point, or when does it start from point A? So for instance, um, 1.22 p.m., 1.22 and 8 seconds, for instance, T subscript A, 
That's the, that's the clock reading as it passes point A. And then let's say that the clock reading is 122.47, 1.22 p.m. and 47 seconds. Let's just, let's just write, go ahead and write those down. Let's say that that's T subscript B, the time that it reaches point B. You know, for any of these paths, you know, and if you, the more segments or the more curvaceous the path, the more time points you're going to need. Because, you know, for the segmented path, you need at least two more time points at each uh, vertex of the straight line segments, at each endpoint of those three straight line segments. So you need the two endpoints, and then you need those two interior points. You need the time at those two points. And even then, you know, you might, you might be traveling on a straight line, but you might be accelerating. So you've got to have um, some knowledge of the variation in the speed. So knowing the path, there's, in this universe, there's very few paths that if you know the path, you also know the speed. You know, so on this one, you know, straight line path, you can, you know, like it's, it's just like the famous story of the tortoise and the hare. You know, they're both traveling the same road. And I have an example of that in the textbook about the tortoise and the hare heading for uh, Dunkin' Donuts out on university. All right. Realistic distances and times. All right. They're both traveling to the same point on the same road, but they don't have the same speeds. And you've got to know that. If you want to make a prediction of, for instance, who's going to win the race, who's going to get those free donuts. So what we need are positions and distances in meters, times and elapsed times in seconds, and directions at each time, and then the speed at each time. So that's a whole lot of information. Right? And the last two are actually um, just a statement about the velocity at each time. Because a velocity is a speed and a time. So if you know the velocity, you actually know two bits of information. Direction and speed. Okay. So if you're going to make... You know, so Galileo was thinking, you know, I've got to be able to figure out this pattern. It's got to be mathematical. I've got to be able to observe it and measure it. And I've got to be able to tell Johannes Kepler up in Germany, that was one of his correspondents, scientific correspondents. He's got to tell them and, and people up in Holland and England, jolly old England, about what he found. He's got to be able to write this stuff down. He's got to write true sentences. And the true sentences are going to have a mathematical flavor. So let's look at the mathematical flavor of speed. Speed is a quotient. It's a quotient um, that gives you the average time rate of change of position. Now let me give you the nomenclature, the terminology for this particular Equation. V equals, de here's what, how we, we refer to it, delta x in the numerator. And that means the difference in two x coordinates. So for instance, it looks like this. So position 2, x2, minus x1, position 1. Or it could be x final, x subscript f, minus x subscript i, x initial. You know, depending on how you write it. It's always later minus earlier. The delta notation, delta x, your later position coordinate minus your earlier position coordinate. Whether you call them x2 and x1 or xf and xi, it's always later minus earlier. And that's the numerator. And that basically gives you the distance between two events. And possibly you might think of the distance as, you know, like a hypotenuse of a right triangle sometimes. So let's throw that in there too, All right? Anytime you have a delta x or um, some kind of a distance between two events, 
it might not be just simply a delta x. It might be a little delta x and a little bit of delta y at the same time. So, you know, so you might have a, a, a right uh, triangle of some kind. So let's say, for example, that the distance is what we found, 36.9. All right, now, the denominator is going to be the elapsed time, and the symbol for that is delta t. Delta, it, the, the triangle, that's a Greek capital letter delta. Greek delta, capital delta. Delta for d, d for difference. Difference meaning subtraction. Later minus earlier. Later time minus earlier time. All right, so um, delta t is going to look a little bit like this. Delta t equals t2 minus t1. All right, and t subscript f minus t subscript i. Final time minus initial time. You know, however you want to label it, it's up to you. Or it might be up to me, you know, how I write the test how I write the homework. Uh, and hey, you guys, how many, what's the elapsed time between, between T subscript B and T subscript A in your notes? Go back and look at your notes. Yep, 39 seconds. You got it? Okay, look at your notes. If you label them the way I had it written down, it should be 39 seconds. All right, so delta T is 39 seconds. And hey, you guys, we can now calculate. <coughs> Delta X, we got it, 36.9. Delta T, we got it, 39 seconds. Let's do it. All right. So let me move this, make it a little smaller. All right, so there's our quotient. Our distance is 36.9 meters and from, from point A to point B. And then 39 seconds, so you're not going very fast, 0.946 meters per second. And you guys might want to make a note, one meter per second is about 2.24 miles per hour. Let me repeat that. Just, you know, ball of, uh, or not, uh, uh, rule of thumb, one meter per second of speed is about 2.24 miles per hour MPH of speed. So this guy's making two point something miles per hour. That's, that's kind of pokey. He's not walking very fast. Now the distance formula, that's the speed quotient. Speed formula, delta x over delta t. The distance formula is based on that. There it is again, v equals delta x over delta t. Now if you cross multiply, you'll get delta x by itself. All right, and so if you know the average speed, you can figure out the total diff distance. Delta X equals V delta T. All right, and that's just the, the first equation. Cross multiplied, get delta T from the bottom and crossed over to the left side, and you got V delta T, and then delta X by itself. All right, so that's the total distance traveled. So if you, and, and we're going to talk more about the, this equation, delta x equals v delta t. We're going to talk about that, and actually we're going to do some, a little bit of calculus with it on Tuesday. But before we do that, you're going to have some homework, and it will include a few basic questions. Uh, I believe this, uh, end of, this graphic is going to be on the homework. Homework one, it'll be pretty, pretty cinchy, not too gigantic. We won't have the really big assignments until next week. Uh, but I'll activate that before supper time tonight. You're dismissed. It'll be due on Tuesday, so uh, I'll see you then. 11.50, right on time. Thank you, dear.